you know, tell me your connection, your strongest connection um, as a woman to this story. My strongest connection uh, to the Waido is through the woman at the centre of the fray, and her name was Te Rongo. Uh, I'm a mukupuna of Te Rongo, uh, whose first marriage was to Blinkensop, uh, who was responsible for uh, the, I guess you could say, the original deed uh, of sale for the Waido. Uh, that dated all the way back to 1835, uh, 1832, and then came back to bite Ngati Toa uh, with the Waido fray in 1843. And at the time of the, of the escalation of tensions on that tragic day in 1843, Te Rongo uh, was married to Te Rangi Haita. Uh, her initial husband, Blinkensop, had been drowned uh, in Sydney when he was over there on business in 1837 and during that time he had, or prior to his death, he'd managed to hock off the Blinkensop deed uh, to the New Zealand company who later used it uh, as the basis for their undisputed claim to the ownership of the Waido lands. So Te Rongo, uh, was right at the centre at the forefront of the events that occurred that day. Not only because she, it was her death that escalated the hostilities and the tensions uh, that resulted in the deaths of the prisoners uh, who, of, the, of Wakefield's posse uh, who had surrendered to Ngati Toa uh, later on as they were trying to escape. Um, but also, uh, Te Rongo features because underlying those tensions um, that, uh, that resulted in, in the tragic deaths on both sides uh, that day uh, was Blinkensop's deed. Uh, and by association to him, uh, as her first husband, um, she ironically and tragically, I guess, paid the ultimate price, being uh, the victim of a stray bullet uh, that shot and killed her um, during uh, an, a, um, an escalating and very tense uh, discussion between the police magistrate, Thompson, and the Ngāti Tor chiefs, Te Raupiraha and Te Rangi Haita, who were being charged with arson for burning down a surveyor's hut uh, and refused to be handcuffed and taken into custody uh, for a hearing and inquiry uh, into that matter uh, by the New Zealand company. While Te Rongo was... Um, really central to the story of the Waido and the tragic events that unfolded, unfolded that day. Uh, that tragic day. Uh, sorry. That's right, carry again. on. Um, so Te Rongo was absolutely central uh, to the events that unfolded uh, in the Waido in 1843. She uh, had two marriages. Uh, the first marriage was to a French whaler and sealer by the name of Captain John Blinkensop, uh, who features very strongly in uh, the events of the Waido, and uh, we'll come back to him uh, when, when we talk more about, uh, you know, the, um, the underlying causes uh, for the friction and tensions that occurred that day. Um, but her second husband, uh, after Blinkensop had drowned in Sydney, uh, was Te Rangi Haeta. Um, and her marriage to Te Rangi Haeta, uh, was a very important Takawainga uh, marriage because it, it expressed uh, and characterised uh, the close whakapapa and historical interrelationships between Ngāti Mutunga and Ngāti Toa that extended back generations to Kāwhia and to Taranaki um, before the heke, uh, 
uh, under uh, Ngāti Toa and Te Rauparaha in the early 1820s to the Cook Strait region. Um, te Rongo was a sister of uh, Paul Mare Ngātata, who was a prominent Ngāti Mutunga chief from northern Taranaki, who played a really important role along with uh, his hapū and his iwi and the Taranaki allies who formed part of the heke uh, in the early 1820s. And he, he later was responsible for capturing the brig, the Lord Rodney, and uh, migrating with Ngāti Mutunga and, and many Ngāti Tama from Wellington to Bari Kauri in 1835. So Te Rongo was a very important uh, person, woman, uh, rangatira, with immense status and mana in her own right. Do you know, is there any uh, uh, information about what she looked like or the characteristics of the woman? I don't know what she looked like. I've often imagined uh, how she would have looked through the features that have passed down uh, through my whanau, through her mokopuna, my great-grandfather, Samawi Pōmare. Um, those features are very strongly represented uh, through subsequent generations of our whanau. So I've often wondered uh, whether they, some of those features may have come from her. Um, but I guess the, the image in my mind, uh, the impression uh, that she has created uh, for me and for my whanau um, is really symbolised through uh, two, two taonga uh, that have been uh, passed down through the generations. Uh, one being a musket uh, that was acquired uh, by Te Rangi Haita uh, from the Waido um, that symbolised, it was supposedly the musket that may have been used uh, to, uh, to kill her that day. It may have been the musket from which the, the stray bullet was fired um, in, the, in the heat of the moment, uh, you know, when one of Wakefield's posse became overwhelmed by fear and trepidation and accidentally let the trigger off, uh, which resulted in her death. So Te Rangi Haita made a point of um, acquiring a musket. Uh, whether it's the one or not, we don't know, but it, but it certainly from the Waido and has symbolised her death and the way in which she died for uh, generations of um, poor Māori descendants. The other tāngu, of course, is, is Te Heke Tua, which is the infamous mere paunamu uh, of Te Rangi Haeta, uh, which he used uh, that day to exact utu on the uh, prisoners from the Wakefields, from Wakefield's posse who had uh, surrendered earlier um, to, uh, to exact, uh, to, to avenge the death of, of Te Rongo. Tell me about that, because there are, you know, a number of ideas about why Te Rangi Hayata, you know, took their lives. What is your idea? Um, you know, it was his wife, but she was also a very important rangatira. Mm. Yes, well, I understand that there has been a lot of debate and controversy over the years, and, and certainly at the time uh, there was outrage. Uh, by Pākehā settlers in Nelson and in Wellington uh, at the way in which those prisoners were, in their view, and understandably so, uh, brutally murdered. Uh, but there is a tikanga Māori context, I think, which is very important to understand. And uh, while his actions may be seen to be at the more extreme end, um, and certainly uh, Rawari Puaha, you know, who a Ngāti Tor chief who had by then converted to Christianity was, was adamantly opposed to the killing of the prisoners and, and Te Rauparaha himself uh, tried to stop Te Rangi Haeta, uh, recognising that the ramifications uh, would be would completely and utterly uh, destructive for Ngāti Tor. Uh, but Tikanga prevailed and there was a recognition, I think, in that case uh, 
that the prerogative uh, was Te Rangi Haitas to determine the fate of those prisoners in accordance with Tikanga Māori, and that's what he did. Um, yes, he had immense personal mana as a rangatira, um, as a paramount leader of exceptional abilities and qualities, um, which you know deserved um, to be atoned for. Um, but his mana, of course, his personal mana was not enough. His mana was reflected in the in the mana of the whole iwi of Ngāti Tua. Um, and so, uh, you know, balancing up, satisfying, um, seeking um, reciprocity for Te Rongo's death in that respect was extremely important from a tikanga Māori perspective. But in addition to that, Te Rongo was a rangatira of immense mana in her own right. From Ngāti Mutunga, um, she, uh, she carried um, a great deal of status and influence amongst her own people, and her marriage to Te Rangi Haata, uh, was in the context of a Takawainga marriage, um, whereby the historical connections, whakapapa relationships between uh, Ngāti Mutunga, Northern Taranaki, and Ngāti Tua, going back to, to Tainu and Kāwhia, um, were recognised and um, characterised and symbolised through their union. And the strength of those relationships were to be maintained and built upon uh, for the future survival and well-being of both iwi and, or of Ngāti Tua and the broader alliance in the Cook Strait region. Well, I think Ngāti Tua were uh, consciously aware of the fact that when they were signing Te Tiriti o Waitangi, uh, they were uh, recognising the importance of Pākehā law and um, the extent or the extent of uh, the, um, the uh, imposition of Pākehā law, you know, in the context of, of uh, Aotearoa. But I think, um, I think there is a context for that too. Um, you know, my understanding of um, how my tūpuna Kahe Te Rau Tarangi uh, perceived her signing of the treaty as one of the few women uh, to sign Te Tiriti, along with her cousin Te Rangi Tōpiora, also of Ngāti Tōa, um, was that um, it was, they were not... Um, uh, yes, I have thought about that. I have thought about the commitment that our tūpuna made uh, to Te Tiriti uh, in terms of recognising, to some degree at least, uh, the importance of Pākehā law in Aotearoa, um, working alongside tikanga Māori. Um, and I've thought about that uh, in the context of the actions that Te Rangi Haata took uh, at the Waido in 1843 in deciding to proceed with killing the prisoners when he was being discouraged from doing that by his uncle Te Rauperaha and other Ngāti Tō chiefs like Rawiri Puaha. And I think that aside from the question of uh, his mana and the mana of his uh, rangatira wahine, uh, Te Rongo, which had to be uh, recognised and uh, toned for and avenged, I think there was uh, another issue that was a really significant factor that is often overlooked, and it relates to um, the trial of a Pākehā, Richard Cook, who was a trader from the Waido, um, for the murder, the brutal murder and rape of a Ngāti Tor woman, a Kweka, who was from the Waido, and her 18-month-old son. And this occurred only about a year before the Waido, uh, the events at the Waido took place in 1842. And the outcome of that trial uh, had only recently uh, been made known to Ngāti Tōa, months before. And while everybody knew that this person, Richard Cook, was responsible 
uh, for Kuika's death, um, including Richard Cook's wife, who wanted to give uh, ev evidence in court and testify against him, but was prevented by virtue of English law, which stopped... Sweated for that train. What is Sorry. that? It's a train. Yes, so Richard Cook's own wife uh, wanted to testify against him in court. She knew he was guilty, uh, but was prevented from giving evidence by virtue of the fact that uh, she, they were married and uh, wives were, were prevented from giving evidence against their husbands under English law. So the case completely fell apart and Richard Cook was, um, he was, what's that word, you know, when you let off? Um. <laughs> he exonerated? Exonerated. Sorry. That's yes. Sorry. Richard Cook was exonerated. He was allowed to leave the country freely with no repercussions, and, um, and Ngāti Tōa, when they heard, felt completely enraged and disillusioned with Pāhā law. Uh, they wanted to take the law into their own hands and exact utu for Kweka's death, uh, but they were prevented from doing so. And so this was, this formed the backdrop. From their, from their, um do you think it was about them honouring Te Tiriti, that they'd bought into a new um, framework of justice? Uh, yes, I think, I think that's partly it. I mean, they were certainly aware of the fact and encouraged and, um, and, um, and supported the idea through Te Tiriti that a, an English system of law would be established and implemented in this country for the benefit of Pāha citizens and settlers. Um, tikanga Māori, of course, would continue to exist and operate alongside it. Um, and in this situation where a Pāha is on trial for murdering, brutally murdering a Māori woman of note and of standing closely related to Te Rangi Haata, Ngāti Tō's expectation was that Pāhā law would deliver justice, and in this case it didn't. A, you know, a justice system that was meant to protect Māori as well from these crimes of this, as explained earlier, the debauchery of the whalers in, yes. in that community, mm. but it didn't. No, exactly. And this caused a great deal of uh, discontentedness and disillusionment amongst Ngāti Tōa, and, um, and Interestingly, actually, uh, in Reverend Ironside's diaries, he was the Wesleyan missionary resident uh, in the Waido and a very close uh, friend of Ngāti Tōa. He noted in his diary that after the prisoners had been executed at the Waido, he spoke to Te Rangi Haita and he asked him outright, you know, what were you thinking? Um, why did, you, why did you proceed to kill them all? And Te Rangi Haita's response was that, or at least one of the reasons he gave, was that Kuika's murder had not been punished by Pākehā law. So I think, I think there's, that gives us insight into Te Rangi Haita's thinking on that day and what motivated him to go to the lengths he did. Um, it was all within the context of tikanga Māori. But yes, I think uh, there were other motivating factors um, that he felt. And at the end of the day, Ngāti Tō supported him because he wasn't stopped, you know, um, in uh, ensuring that Te Rongo's death was not in vain, uh, that, it was, that it was appropriately uh, avenged uh, within the bounds of tikanga Māori, uh, and it was done in such a way uh, that recognised her mana and also atoned for the unpunished murder of Kweka and, and her son at the Waido only a year, year prior argue 
that Waido is all about Te rongo, because it's her second husband that ends it, but it was her first husband, husband that started it. Can mm. you tell us about um, her first husband? And why would she have been married to a whaler? Well, Te Rongo's first husband uh, was Captain John Blinkensop, uh, a whaler and trader, uh, who sailed into Te Whanganui Atara in the early 1830s. Uh, and he first encountered Ngāti Mutunga, who were living around the environs of Te Whanganui Atara, and uh, they and their Atiawa relations were in control of the trade and, and, um, and the interactions uh, with, with Pākehā um, uh, land speculators and, and also uh, commercial uh, business types uh, at that time. And so Blinkensop uh, very early on um, encountered uh, Paul Marangatata who was living at a pa called Kumitoto on the edge of, of the harbour where the CBD is now and in a central location. Uh, so there was no escaping, uh, you know, going to meet with and talk, talk with uh, this particular uh, rangatira who had a lot of influence at the time. And uh, they came to an agreement uh, that Blinkensop could uh, stay in the area, he could trade uh, in Te Whanganui Atara and in parts of the Waido where Ngāti Mutunga also had influence and mana um, on certain conditions, of course, uh, that uh, he would respect and abide by the tikanga um, that was... Um, uh, you know, that was imposed um, by Ngāti Mutunga at that time. And part of the arrangement was that um, he would be given a, given a, a wife uh, to ensure that um, he upheld, you know, the uh, tenets of the agreement that was made. This was in the early 1830s, um, and so... What, just before you go on, yeah. what would that have meant for um, Te Rongo's whānau, for Ngātata... What's his last name? Paul Mare Ngātata. Uh, Paul Mare yeah. Ngātata and the, and the iwi of Te Whanganui Ātara. Mm. Would it bring something for mm. them? Yes, so um, this was seen as a really important uh, relationship, and um, uh, in terms of the benefits that uh, trade could bring for Ngāti Mutunga and Taranaki Iwi, who had only recently moved into the environs of Wellington Harbour. And it was difficult uh, in that location, not being right on the edge of Cook Strait, um, to attract the same uh, kinds of commercial uh, opportunities. Um, and so this, this was a prime opportunity. This was a whaler who had sailed into Te Whanganui Atara, you know, um, and, and was almost, you know, um, presented up to uh, Ngāti Mutunga um, in a way that couldn't be ignored. Um, so there, were, there was an expectation uh, that the benefits from that relationship would result um, in the ability, a greater ability for Ngāti Mutunga to establish uh, trading uh, and commercial opportunities that weren't there uh, at that time, um, and so uh, with, with the with because he was French, yeah. So so commercial and trading opportunities with the world, or you know, like what I mean mm. at that time it was they they didn't really know, did they? But they knew it was important. Yes, and I mean in terms of the trading and commercial opportunities that Ngāti Ngāti Mutunga was seeking, and and Ngāti Tua, um, as part of the broader alliance, of course, these were international uh, relationships, um, potentially, uh, that were uh, growing, uh, that were developing, um, and very quickly, uh, you know, um, Ngāti Tōa and, and, and its allies, Taranaki allies, were developing a reputation um, on an international scale uh, that hadn't was completely unprecedented. And there were whaling and trading ships arriving in Rokawa Moana and Cook Strait uh, on a regular basis. Um, but 
Wellington Harbour was in some ways, you know, a, a bit of a backwater and it was difficult to get the same opportunities uh, to establish that kind of trade there. So Blinkensop provided that uh, opportunity and it was through his marriage to Te Rongo, Paul Maringatata's sister, that the benefits uh, from, uh, from the trade that Blinkensop could offer were, were actually realised. What was described their marriage to us? Do you, what do you know of it? Did they have children and how old were they? They had, I'm not sure how, how old they would have been. I think um, Te Rongo was probably fairly young, I would say in her 20s, perhaps early 20s. Um, they went and lived uh, in the Waido predominantly, but they were backwards and forwards uh, to Te Whanganui Atara. Um, and um, Blinkensop, uh, his main trading base was in Sydney, Australia. So he was backwards and forwards uh, to Australia and Te Rongo lived uh, predominantly uh, in the Waido. They had one son uh, whose name was Wiramu Naida, Paul Mare. And uh, he was given the name Paul Mare after his uncle, uh, Paul Mare Ngātata. And following Te Rongo's death uh, at the Waido in 1843, um, Wiramu Naida, who was only a small boy of around eight years old at the time, uh, was whāngaid by his uncle, Paul Maringatata, and he was raised uh, on whare uh, and succeeded to his mana as a chief of Ngāti Mutunga. Tell me of the, the end of the relationship or what you know of the relationship between Blinkensop and Te Rongo. I know that Te Rongo was aware that Blinkensop had drafted a deed to try to dupe Te Rauparaha and her brother, Paul Maringatata, Te Rangi Haata, and a number of other Ngāti Tō and Taranaki chiefs out of their interests in the Waido lands. Um, this deed was dated to around about 1832, and Blinkensop drafted a number of copies. He got uh, these chiefs to sign it, um, telling them that, or leading them to believe that uh, the purpose of the deed was to secure uh, his access to resources, uh, to timber, to water, uh, to enable his uh, sustenance um, down in, in the Waido. Uh, but the wording of the deed was far broader than that and, and far more um, uh, far more serious in that uh, it included hundreds of thousands of acres of the Waido Plains uh, that uh, by virtue of the signatures um, appended to this deed uh, were supposed to have transferred uh, to Blinkensop uh, and, and um, was, this deed was supposed to have given him uh, full and un undisturbed uh, ownership and possession of the Waido Plains. These men who, these rangatira, who their reputations, uh, you know, were nationwide at that point, even in the 1830s, do you believe they would have just signed everything over to a, a whaler? Absolutely not. I mean, they had absolutely no intention, uh, clearly, of signing all that land in the Waido over to a whaler nor did they have any concept of what uh, the sale of land entailed. Uh, they had a completely different view uh, of, of the whenua. Uh, they were part of the whenua. They descended from it uh, rather than being ascendant to it. So um, a notion, the notion that uh, a rangatira, no matter how you know, uh, prominent and influ influential they may have been, could actually sell the land was, was beyond their frame of reference. I mean, it was an impossibility. Um, so clearly they had no intention of doing that. Um, they were uh, tricked into believing uh, that, uh, that the deed was really just about securing um, resources for Blinkensop. Uh, 
to be able to uh, provide uh, for himself and his family while living in the Wairau and conduct his trading activities, um, which were ultimately seen to be for the benefit of Ngāti Tōa and their allies in the Cook Strait region. And the land would have been his wife's anyway, wouldn't it? Yes, so, I mean, his, his, and that's exactly right. Um, the, the land didn't require uh, any special kind of formal, um, you know, uh, uh, deed or agreement uh, for Blinkensop to be able to uh, live there and establish his, his home there because the, the ability to do that for him came through his marriage to Te Rongo. That That was the whole point of it, was to allow him access to land and resources and uh, while at the same time uh, providing benefit to Ngāti Mutunga, to Ngāti Tōa and the, uh, the, the allied iwi from Taranaki and Tainu in the Cook Strait region uh, who were developing a, um, an internationally um, you know, uh, renowned uh, trading empire uh, at that time. It sounds like Wall Street in the Rokawa Strait. <laughs> um, you know, not many people really, really understand the environment that was going on. Can you describe what it might have been like? Well, I, I know that um, during the whaling season, uh, so for a number of months in the latter part of each year, there were so many trading and whaling ships in the Cook Strait and in the top of the South Island, um, that it was difficult to find a berth. You know, uh, the Cook Strait became a, a hub uh, for international trade from Australia, uh, from parts of Europe, from the Americas. Um, and uh, Kapiti Island, of course, was sort of the entry point for uh, trading ships entering the Cook Strait region and they they were encouraged and in fact uh, usually um, needed to, to stop there not just to pay tribute to Te Rauparaha, uh, who was often on the island um, but also to gather supplies and resources to continue their journey south. The connection between Te Rongo's two husbands is a very, very interesting one and uh, a very tense one um, and a very tragic one. Uh, Te Rongo, um, Blinkensop was the, um, the whaler, the trader who was responsible uh, for, uh, for the, the dirty deed uh, that was on sold to the New Zealand company in Sydney just before Blinkensop's death in 1837, uh, that became the primary basis um, in the broader context of the 1839 Kapiti deed as well, but, but the primary basis for the New Zealand Company's uh, claim to undisputed ownership and title to the Wairau lands was through Blinkensop's deed. Um, and so the relationship between Blinkensop and Te Rangi Haita, of course, uh, is that Te Rangi Haita, uh, ended up marrying Te Rongo um, and, and as a result of her um, tragic and somewhat ironic death uh, that day, which, which of course uh, was ultimately caused um, by... Blinkensop's uh, a deed having 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 been on sold to the New Zealand Company those years before, um, is that Te Rangi Haerata ended up uh, in a position of defending uh, Ngāti Tō's lands, of resisting uh, the company's claims uh, to ownership, and then ultimately um, avenging Te Rongo's death by taking the lives of those uh, prisoners. I don't think that really answers no, no, the question, that, does no, it? No, it does, it does. He has an underwhelming um, 
you know, history in New Zealand, really, when you consider the, what, you know, his actions, what they caused. Mm. He's not even mentioned. Mostly he's not mentioned in much of the history. He's like, he's r really unknown. Mm. Why do you think that is? You're talking about Blink himself? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's a really interesting point. Um, he is, he's become an obscure sort of figure uh, in, in our history, and yet he is right at the heart of the wider fray, uh, of, you know, the first real flashpoint of... Um, of hostility, armed conflict between Pākehā and Māori in this country that underpinned the subsequent wars, the New Zealand wars as they came to be known. So he is, Blinkensop is a pivotal character um, in the, not just in the early history uh, of, of the Wairo, of New Zealand through his association with the Wairo, but, but actually, in, in the way in which uh, New Zealand has evolved historically and developed into the country that it is now. Because his actions not only had a hugely uh, deleterious impact on Ngāti Tōa, uh, leading ultimately you know, to the loss of all of our land, Ngāti Tor's resistance, ironically, um, to Blinkensop's deed and to the New Zealand Company claims of ownership to the Wairo, ultimately led to the loss of that land at the hands of the Crown in 1846 um, and the loss of all, our, all of our prime lands in the top of the South Island and in the Porirua district. So Blinkensop is at the centre of that. He sparked it. It's not to say that there wouldn't have been another incident or another event uh, that wouldn't have sparked it, but it was him. And yet we know very little about Blinkensop. Um, and I think probably the only reason why he's featured in, in my history, my, my sense of, of the history so strongly is because Fortunately or unfortunately, I happen to be a descendant. You're French. French. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Te Rongo? Do we know where she was buried? And you know, what's her story after she was after she was taken, after they killed her? I don't know uh, where Te Rongo is now. I understand that she was buried in the Waido, uh, following the Waido fray, um, and. I remember as a child hearing stories about her body being disinterred and her skull being found uh, with the bullet hole uh, between the eyes, which, which was the story that we had heard growing up, but I can't corroborate that. Um, so, but I guess, um, you know, she has, because of those stories, because of the imagery, that those stories create uh, on, on a child's mind, um, you never forget them. And it has coloured my perception of her as a person, of her as a woman, uh, of her as a wife, um, of her as a rangatira, um, you know, who, who was living uh, through times of extreme turbulence and change, um, and who had a really important role to play to try to bring together and to unify um, the whakapapa and historical connections between really important iwi at that time in the Cook Strait and to, and to ensure that those relationships survived into the future. And I think she achieved that. Uh, it was a tragic end to, um, you know, a, a life that was possibly no more important than any other life at that time. But you can't help but think, you know, how ironic it is that she, you know, she, that she find, found herself at the centre of, um, a, 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 you know, an episode in our history um, that has shaped and influenced the direction our entire country 
has taken in many ways, both in terms of you know the being the starting point, the flashpoint uh, for what was to come in terms of the New Zealand wars, and also in terms of the influence that the Waio incident had on the legal system, the evolution of the um, the legal and political system in this country. Um, yeah, she's she is a person I think who is uh, a, bit, a little bit like Blinkensop, you know, has become obscure and uh, relatively um, silent and invisible uh, in the historical landscape, and yet she, like Blinkensop, but in opposite ways, I guess, has had an indelible imprint uh, on the history of this nation. How do Nga, do you see qualities of her in Ngāti Toa Wahine? Absolutely, absolutely. And Ngāti Mutunga what are they? Wahine. Uh, I think strength, I think, um, I think about uh, intelligence. Um, I think there's an element of, uh, you know, um, of, um, of empathy um, and, and an ability to adapt and change uh, to new and uh, modern circumstances, um, you know, a, a constantly evolving world. Um, I mean, we're going through, you know, unprecedented change uh, globally now. Uh, we, we are living through a period, I think, in the history uh, of uh, humanity that has never been seen before. Um, but our tūpuna, you know, the turbulence and the change that they lived through and had to adapt through uh, in their world, in the, in the early 1840s, uh, following closely on the heels of Te Tiriti, was, I think, um, completely unprecedented. And they had an incredible ability to overcome adversity, to overcome uncertainty, which I think we can take great stock from now. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and comfort in, in knowing that uh, they, they always held firm to who they were, their identity, their whakapapa, um, their knowledge of their world and adapted that to suit uh, whatever circumstances mm. they were confronted by uh, you know, in, fu in, fu in the future. Just going to circle back now to Wairo, and so as a result of the actions that Te Rangi Hayata took, what do you think the consequences of that were for Ngāti Toa? For, well, let's start mm. with those two individuals, that, so Te Rau Paraha and Te Rangi Hayata, walking away, and those other rangatira walking away from that. What happened to them? Where did they go? Yes, the consequences uh, of the actions Te Rangihaita took at the Waido on that fateful day uh, have been, uh, have continued to be felt uh, by the iwi, uh, Ngāti Toa, and, and I think our allies uh, to, to today. Um, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the Waido, um, Governor Fitzroy, of course, conducted an inquiry uh, and his decision uh, was that uh, Ngāti Tō were, were vindicated of, of any direct blame and responsibility for having caused uh, the events at the Waido. Um, although, you know, uh, although the actions of Te Rangi Haita um, were condemned, but uh, but there was no, there was no further punishment or retribution uh, recommended by Governor Fitzroy at that time, um, given the context in which those events occurred, which were very much caused by the actions of the New Zealand Company officials. Um, but then, you know, Ngāti Tua... Yeah, did it matter? In the end, it didn't matter. In the end, the official, uh, you know, view uh, of the Crown, the Crown's representative in Aotearoa, it didn't matter because there was outrage and there was, um, uh, you know, there, there was an outcry 
from the Pahar settlers in Nelson and in Wellington who demanded retribution and who demanded uh, that Te Rauparaha and Te Rangihata, uh, be held responsible uh, for what they considered to be the cold-blooded murder uh, of prisoners who had been taken after surrendering themselves, their lives, to the hand, into the hands of Ngāti Toa. And they, uh, they were fearful uh, of uh, further attacks and reprisals from Ngāti Toa on their communities, and they demanded that uh, the, the British government do something about it. So it wasn't long after uh, Fitzroy's uh, report came out vindicating Ngāti Tor that he was removed from office and he was replaced by Governor Gray. Uh, and Governor Gray arrived in the Wellington region uh, with a very strong uh, military force uh, and uh, with clear instructions uh, and directives from uh, the British uh, government to support and assist the New Zealand Company uh, in acquiring the land that it was claiming uh, through its previous land purchasing arrangements um, for the benefit of settlers who had either arrived in Aotearoa by that stage uh, on the expectation of receiving their land or who were on their way. Mm. What, what are your thoughts about, I mean, as a descendant of Te Rongo, how do you view the actions of Te Rangi Hayata? That's a hard question, I know it is, but you must have thought about that. Well, I mean, it, it is a difficult question to answer because, of course, we have the benefit of hindsight now. Um, but I think... Te Rangi Hayata already had the benefit of hindsight before he took the actions that he did. He was acting purely, I think, and instinctively uh, out of respect for upholding the tikanga that he had been instilled with um, and that he felt he had an obligation to uphold um, in order to protect uh, and uh, maintain the mana of Ngāti Toa, the mana of Ngāti Mutunga, Te Rongo's people, and the mana of all the iwi uh, who were part of the, of the heke who migrated to the Cook Strait region in the early 1820s and were, were going to be and were all affected uh, by the events that occurred that day in the Wairo. So. You know, I can understand why he took the action that he did. Um, I can also understand Te Rauparaha's perspective, you know, as, as, um, as a more pragmatic, I guess, um, leader uh, of those times um, who, who could see the writing on the wall and uh, who very quickly uh, recognised that um, the repercussions uh, of from killing those prisoners, um, uh, you know, would would be uh, would be immense, uh, and and um, and so, but I, I do think underlying, I, I can understand both perspectives, and I think both were motivated by the same reasons, uh, which were ultimately to um, protect. Uh, and uphold the interests of the iwi. Do you think that um, you know those actions put Ngāti Toa and their allies in a position that you know wasn't against the crown? Like, what's the relationship mm. with the crown been in the last hundred and eighty years? Yes. Well, the and is it still like that today? Mm. Yeah. The co the consequences. Uh, of Te Rangi Hayata's actions that day uh, were dire for Ngāti Tōa and, and our allies in the sense that um, 
Ngāti Tors uh, resistance uh, to the sale of land uh, elsewhere in Aurohe, uh, including the Hutt Valley, um, became then uh, points of um, um, focus for the Crown uh, in targeting um, Ngāti Tor uh, leaders, and particularly Te, Rang te Rauparaha and Te Rangi Haita, um, as part of a broader crown strategy to undermine Ngāti Tor's rangatiratanga uh, and influence um, throughout the Cook Strait region. The crown became more determined and more militaristic uh, in its in endeavours and in its focus following the events at the Waido uh, to ensure that it acquired uh, land um, in whatever, by whatever means necessary and ultimately what that meant was war. So, you know, the, the, motive, the motivation, I guess, the underlying cause of the dispute uh, between Ngāti Tōa and the New Zealand Company and later the Crown at the Waido uh, was of course essentially to do with land theft. I mean, the, in, the insatiable uh, pāhau appetite for land. Um, and that, uh, that, so that became more and more apparent uh, as a result, I think, of the events at the Waido um, and and uh, as a result of you know more direct and clear instructions from the British government to Gray uh, to ensure that those obligations to the New Zealand Company settlers for land uh, were able to be satisfied. It, is it ironic that so many years later that Crown set up? Their whare in your rohe? Yes, uh, yeah, well, it is, it is ironic that the Crown, 100 and what, 70, 80 years later, uh, established its prime quarters uh, in our rohe, in a sense. Although I think Grey, Grey always recognised, you know, from very early on, uh, the strategic importance of this part of the country, it was considered to be middle New Zealand, uh, you know, Tūpoko Tika, the head of the fish, uh, in terms of, um, you know, rolling out its colonisation scheme and policies. So I think, um, you know, having the headquarters for the Crown here in, in the Cook Strait area, um, in some ways made a lot of sense. Um, this was where, you know, all the, the trade, the activity, the political and, um, the political and military, uh, you know, activities of the country were, um, were occurring here and, and up north. Um, but in the Cook Strait, of course, um, you know, the Crown was able to get access uh, to the South Island uh, as well as the as the the North Island, um, so it it's it is it is kind of ironic, um, but but it also but it also I think you know we have clues of that sort of um, uh, that that may have happened or would have happened by the way in which the Crown played out its earlier strategy uh, in undermining Ngāti Tor's mana. You know, when they established their headquarters at Paremata, the barracks, um, and and uh, those barracks were um, were were used um, by Grey's uh, troops uh, to to um, uh, to formulate their plans, uh, their plan plans to 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 both. Um, Attack Te Rangi Haiata, uh, and his um, his allies Ngāti Rangatahi in, in the Hutt Valley, um, which led to ultimately uh, 
uh, to Te Rangihata's last battle at Battle Hill in Pawatahanui in 1846, and he used those barracks also to coordinate uh, Te Rauparaha's kidnap and detention from Taupopa in Plymouthton, um, and held Te Rauparaha prisoner for 18 months uh, to ensure that he he wasn't able to undermine or influence in any way the Crown's um, plans to attack Te Rangihata and force him into exile, um, and also to use Te Rauparaha uh, as ransom, ultimately, um, to acquire Ngāti Tor's prime lands that formed the basis of the New Zealand Company's claims in the Waido and in the Puridua region. Are you saying, do you, is it, is, do you think that following Waido, the Crown um, targeted the two of them? Following the Waido incident, uh, the Crown definitely, well, and Gray's appointment in, in, in place of Governor Fitzroy, um, the Crown then devised a deliberate and intentional military campaign targeting Ngāti Tors, uh, leading Rangitira, Te Rauparaha and Te um, uh, with the intention of attacking uh, Te Rangihaata in the Hutt Valley and um, in Pawatahanui and, uh, and taking uh, Te Rauparaha captive and detaining him um, so that he could be used um, as a uh, basically, to um, um, you know, as a as a um, negotiating chip. Did that affect their leadership? You know, with the other iwi and the other allies. It was the beginning of the downfall of Ngāti Tor, and and in that sense, the Waido really uh, was the beginning of the end for Ngāti Tor. Um, the capture of Te Rauparaha, the exile of Te Rangihaata, it left Ngāti Tō devoid of our traditional leadership uh, at a time when we needed it most. And the result of that um, was hugely detrimental to Ngāti Tō and our allies at the time. Te Rauparaha and Te Rangihaata never returned to Purirua uh, to take up residence, to live, to exercise their leadership ever again. A younger generation of Ngāti Tor chiefs were, um, you know, were unwittingly and prematurely placed in a position uh, of having to try to negotiate with Grey for the release of their matua, of their rangatira, te rauparaha, uh, while at the same time being coerced into giving up all of our land. It was an unenviable and unforgivable uh, situation for them to be in. And that's ultimately what caused uh, the beginning of the end for Ngāti Tōr, uh, the decline of uh, our mana, our rangatiratanga throughout Raukawa Moana, the um, maritime commercial empire that uh, had been established uh, through the 1830s on the back, back of whaling and, um, uh, and the harakeke trade uh, came crashing down. Um, we were devoid of leadership and uh, we were left virtually landless uh, by 1850. Uh, as a consequence of of Gray's actions, so yes, the uh, the impact of Gray's strategy in targeting Te Rauparaha and Te Rangihaata, uh, at that time uh, was hugely detrimental uh, to Ngāti Tor and our allies in, in the Cook Strait, um, and and of course formed the basis uh, for our treaty claim. Uh, to the Waitangi Tribunal, and subsequently um, the Crown has acknowledged uh, that the actions, its actions, of taking Te Rauparaha prisoner, 
never holding him, um, never charging him with any offence or, um, or taking, providing him with the opportunity uh, to be tried um, was a breach of the treaty, uh, as was the military attack on Te Rangihaata in the Hutt Valley and his forced exile. So the Crown has now acknowledged uh, those actions as being absolutely fundamental to, to the loss of Ngāti Tō's mana and rangatiratanga throughout uh, Aurohe and, uh, and that forms a really important basis for the redress that has been provided to Ngāti Tō through our treaty settlement. What's the, what was the end like for, you know, where, how did they die, how old were they, where are they? Te Rangihaia to start with him. Well, Te um passed away in, I think it was the uh, 1855, I think, somewhere around there. So following uh, the battle at Battle Hill in 1846, uh, he lived roughly another 10 years uh, at Poro Tafal, north of Levin, and was buried there. Um, he never conceded to British uh, rule or British law. Um, he never wore European clothing. He never adapted European customs and never converted to Christianity. Um, Te Rauparaha, well, he was released uh, eventually, 18 months later. Um, he was held for 10 months of those on board a ship and uh, the rest of the time he was held at the Auckland Domain. Uh, so he was brought back to Ōtaki and released there uh, and his challenge to his people when he was released was um, to build a church and that church became Rangiatia. And while he never himself converted to Christianity, he saw uh, that as a pathway to the future survival uh, of, of his people. Um, and he was buried at Rangiatia. And, um, and what we know is that uh, his body uh, may have been uh, disinterred and, and taken to Kapiti Island, but that's, for, that's really for others to talk about. You have, um, last question, um, through the, throughout the whole um, interview and I guess the whole story of Ngāti Toa and the Waido is this mere paunamu that you're holding. Um, whose was it and why is that so special? Well this mere paunamu belonged to Te Rangi Haata Ko te heke tua, tōna ingoa. And, I mean, it has a, a wealth of history and stories that predate uh, Te Rangi Haata's possession of it. Um, but in the, in the short time that it was in his possession, of course, it has seen many battles. And ultimately, it's become recognised for its role in the context of the Waidoa Fray in 1843. This is the mere paunamu that uh, Te Rangi Haiata used uh, to exact utu on the nine prisoners who had surrendered to Ngāti Tōa uh, during their fray. And my understanding is that he used this mere himself uh, on each one of those uh, prisoners um, to avenge the death of Te Rongo, and the other Ngāti Tōa who were killed that day too. There was a tragic loss of life on both sides um, during the exchange of uh, fire. Uh, there were roughly even numbers of Ngāti Tōa and New Zealand settlers uh, who were killed and left on the, on the battlefield, if you like. Um, the remaining prisoners were executed by by Te Rangi Haata, uh, with his with his personal mere, uh, which 
I think, uh, signifies uh, the fact that he was operating in accordance with tikanga Māori. He was exercising his mana as a rangatira and he was exercising his mana uh, in accordance with tikanga Māori and in a way that was respectful if, if I can put it that way. He, he could have used another weapon. He could have used a European weapon. He could have used the musket that he acquired on that day uh, and that Ngāti Tor still have in our possession to, to constantly remind us uh, of how Te Rongo died. But he chose to use his mere paunamu and he chose to use this mere paunamu uh, which has huge significance not only for Ngāti Tor but for many area around the country uh, who have, um, in whose possession uh, it has been and uh, who have had the benefit of it uh, themselves in battle and uh, and subsequently as a, as a token of of um, of peacemaking and and other things so so this is the this is the tino taonga uh, or te rangi um, which we uh, which we cherish and uh, it is one of the most um, highly treasured uh, taonga in the possession of the iwi today when you hold it, being a descendant of Te Rongo, do you feel like a connection? Well, I personally, um, I have always, I have always seen uh, Te Heke to it in that light uh, because of my uh, connection to Te Rongo. Um, of course, Te Rangi Haiata is remembered for many, many things. Um, he was an incredibly powerful and influential. Uh, leader of his time and in a tohunga um, with with so many uh, important uh, aspects of our traditional knowledge um, to share and impart um, not least of all was his ability uh, as an expert carver and so there are many many you know aspects of Te Rangi Hayata's life that uh, are reflected in, in a taonga such as this, which which was his personal um, taonga. But when I hold it and look at it, I think of uh, I think of Te Rongo, I think of you know the the significance of her life and the signif the significance of her death and uh, the impact uh, that that has had and continues to have uh, on Ngāti Tōa and, um, and our nation of Aotearoa. Um, and I think it's important that uh, these taonga are preserved and uh, are used in, in ways that bring these stories to life so that um, not only us as the descendants but all of those of us in this country who have been impacted and who uh, can connect to um, to uh, to the history. Um, can continue to um, uh, value those uh, those stories and and find um, inspiration in them, you know, for the future. Kia ora. So yeah, tell tell me your strongest connection to Te Rongo as a wahine from Ngāti Toa. Oh, kia ora. Well, my strongest connection uh, to Te Rongo um, as wahine, when I think about what that means, uh, is, is actually through my Ngāti Toa, Ngāti Mutunga uh, connections. Uh, she was the sister of Pōmare Ngātata, who was one of the prominent uh, Ngāti Mutunga leaders uh, from northern Taranaki, who came down with Ngāti Toa on the heke and played a very prominent role. Uh, in the conquest and, and settlement of Raukawa Moana, Cook Strait, 
And then subsequently, uh, 1835, uh, migrated to Whanakaudi uh, with most of Ngāti Mutunga and a lot of Ngāti Tama from the Wellington region. So Te Rongo, uh, was a woman who, uh, who was of immense uh, status. Uh, she had mana in her own right as a rangatira. She was a strong, forthright, formidable woman uh, who played a really important role uh, at the time of the migration, the heke, um, and also in forming subsequent relationships uh, that brought about uh, trade and prosperity uh, for the benefit of her iwi uh, in the 1830s and 40s. And she did that through her marriage, first of all, to uh, Captain John Blinkensop, a whaler and trader uh, who uh, sailed into Te Whanganui Atara in the early 1830s and very quickly uh, formed a relationship uh, with Paul Maringatata, uh, Te Rongo's brother, um, and found himself uh, in an arranged marriage uh, with Te Rongo. Um, that was a marriage that was seen to be important uh, and profitable uh, for the relationships uh, of the iwi of the Cook Strait at the time and the international uh, trading uh, opportunities that were, uh, that were growing and increasing at an exponential rate. Um, so she was, she was a woman who had many facets to her uh, personality and to her character and uh, to her life. Um, she played an important role as many of our, our rangatira uh, women did um, at that time in uh, providing the interface between Māori and Pākehā uh, interrelationships that would take us into the future for better or for worse. Um, she was right at that coalface. Uh, and she was also uh, seen by um, uh, Ngāti Toa uh, to be an important uh, interface um, and uh, taka waenga uh, um, relationship uh, with Ngāti Mutunga. Um, and so her marriage to Tarangi Haata, some years later, after Blinkensop had died uh, in Australia, um, was regarded as an important uh, marriage uh, to maintain those close inter-iwi uh, relationships and alliances um, that had been formed um, many generations prior.